welcome to the Kitsap Literary Artists and Writers and its monthly author showcase. I am your host, Peter Stockwell. Author Jeff Ayers is visiting with us this month at the Bremerton Kitsap Access Television Studios. Jeff and I met when I became a member of the Pacific Northwest Writers Association. He has worked as a staff member at Seattle Public Library and as a freelance reviewer and author. One of his mysteries, long overdue, had readers explore the unknown depths of the downtown branch as he destroyed several areas of the building. Jeff, welcome to our broadcast for Kitsap Literary Artists and Writers. Nice to meet you again, and thanks everybody for having me be here. I appreciate it. Star Trek. That has been one of the engaging parts of your life's history. You even wrote a pretty good book. Can you tell us about creating Voyages of, of Imagination, the Star Trek fiction companion, which I, gives enthusiasts a franchise history of the over 550 novels and the various shows and films. Who knew? I was a huge Trekkie, and I bought all the novels as they were coming out, watched all the shows faithfully, and I had an entire bookshelf devoted to all the books. And one day, I had a job issue. I had a midlife crisis, and I started doubting myself. And my wife, my beautiful wife, pulled me aside and she said, Hey, you've always wanted to write. This is an opportunity for you to try and pursue that. You should do it. And thankfully, I listened to her. Um, I had heard about the Pacific Northwest Writers Association. And I decided I'm going to go there and I'm going to pitch a book. And I'm going to get an agent and going to do all that stuff. And so having been a fan of the Star Trek novels and the shows, as I mentioned, um, I realized that one of the books I always wanted to read was a guide to all the books. I would love to see an oral history of the people who wrote them as well and sort of a nice timeline of everything. And then it dawned on me, wait a minute. That book doesn't exist. Why don't I write it? <laughs> it so, makes sense to me. <laughs> so what I did is I wrote a proposal, and then I went to the conference. Now, the conference at that time is different now. If you go to meet agents today, it's more like speed dating. You get in a line, then you sit down, and you get three minutes with the person. Back then, it was you get a meeting with one agent for 15 minutes. And so um, set up the meeting and everything else, and... The funny end to that part is that I got an agent from the conference, but it was not the one I had the meeting with. It just happened to be someone I was chatting with in the hall. So after it was over, um, I sent the proposal to her, and she sent the proposal to Simon & Schuster, who owned the Star Trek license. And the editor later told me that he, the reason he bought the book is because I was the first person who wanted to create a history and not just a fancy organized list. And uh, when it was done, I had read or reread over 550 novels, and I interviewed over 350 people. It was an amazing experience. It opened a lot of doors, and my wife said, I put my bookcase to good use. Yeah. I know you did have a lot of work on that, because we've had discussions about that. Two and a half you, years worth, yes. You were very excited about it. Oh, it was a lot of fun. Well, as a member of the staff of the Seattle Public Library, and you're at the downtown branch, right? Yes. Your murder mystery, Long Overdue, did give readers a view of the intricacies of this marvelous <laughs> building, that is, before you destroyed it. Uh, what inspired your mind to create such mayhem? Well, first of all, I rebuilt it, but that's beside the point. Um, <laughs> and, my, and my boss for a while was terrified of me. Uh, she read the book and she said, I can't believe you did those things. <laughs> but um, I always had my, in the back of my mind since high school, I wanted to write a novel that involved SWAT moving through a building. And... I just had this image of SWAT and this going on. So when the Central Library reopened with the brand new building that looks like a cheese grater, that's downtown Seattle, in 2004, there was a uh, Stranger article about the building of the library and the opening. And I want to read you the title of that article Okay. from June 10th, 2004. The new Central Library offers civic validation a huge collection of material, and a staggering number of startling new ways to die. 
the minute I saw that article, I said, there's my book. There's the book. That's the start of Long Overdue. But the fun thing about it was um, it was an opportunity for me to meet SWAT officers and work with them. I got to meet the chief hostage negotiator for the city of Seattle Police Department at the time. And they read an early draft to make sure I got all the little details right. I got to work with uh, the city of Seattle library security department to make sure I got all those little details right as well. And um, it, it, was, it was a fun experience. Now someday I'd like to write another library novel, but I don't know the plot yet, but I have the title thanks to two author friends, mm -hmm. Dewey Decimated. Dewey Decimated? <laughs> Very good. Well, besides the library work, you've been a, library, a literary reviewer for Library Journal, the Associated Press, and other organizations. What have you learned in your explorations of other authors' manuscripts which have made your stories and books better? Well, I have to start by saying I've been a reader since I was three years old and just love being surrounded by books, and that's why I actually got involved in working in libraries. And an opportunity presented itself to start reviewing books for Library Journal, and I jumped on it. And I discovered new authors. I discovered the structure and layout of how novels work because I had to tell you why this book was good or why it was bad. And I learned that you have to have the characters, you have to have the setting, and the individual scenes all sing together to make a beautiful choir. And I'm still trying to learn and improve my writing with every project I do. And um, while I love picking up books that you got a great plot, you got great three-dimensional characters, I turn around and try to use that method for myself. I think all of us do. We do. We do. Yeah. Um, but the truth is, every author's voice is different. If we gave a writing prompt to 10 different people, they would all come up with 10 different stories of the same. You know, it'd all, it'd all be different, even though we were all using the same prompt. And that's kind of fun. It is. We, we were talking at Thriller Fest last year. Uh, someone put up a sign promoting their book, and it was supposed to say special ops guy, but there was a typo, and it said special UPS guy. So we were wondering what <laughs> this guy's skill was opening packages. And so there's a bunch of us who are wanting to do something similar with There that. was something wrong with his delivery? Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Well, you know, that's one of the things that we do find, and we try to, you know, when we're editing, we do try to get all that <laughs> crap out of there and make sure everything's right. But I, right. I have seen mistakes. So now, since you work on the library, I suppose you do get questions about how you get books into the library. I so, get it often, yes. How does an aspiring author get his book on the shelves? Um, so I have to say, honestly, it's an uphill battle. So if you are published by a small press or if you self-publish, it's like climbing Everest without an oxygen tank, honestly. Libraries today primarily use review journals to determine what they're going to buy. There's also a centralized department that orders the books for Seattle and also now around the country. And the book vendors create lists that those libraries order off of. So unless you're published by one of the big five publishers or one of their imprints and you don't have a review, you're pretty much out of luck. Yeah, you could request it, but then again, if you are not um, with one of those vendors like Ingram or Baker and Taylor, and also there's discounts involved. If you're not a certain discount, then they can't order it either. Right. So it really is an uphill battle. I feel like Sisyphus. <laughs> yes. I did take my books over to our local uh, Kitsap Region Library because I had friends. And I did donate the books. Mm -hmm. And so they made it to the shelves. And I do understand that is one way of getting your books in, but it won't be nationwide. It'll be if you have friends in a local area that you can get your books into. And if the books are well received by the public and checked out a lot, they might order your books. That's as I understand it. Th that is true. That's, um, as you said, that's only going to happen on a local basis. Right. And some libraries don't even take their donations and put them on the shelf. Yeah. They'll actually donate them to the friends of their library for their book sale and then maybe turn around and order them, maybe not. Yeah. We're going to work on that. We're going to work on that. We've got to work on that, absolutely. Because um, in today's market, there are so many writers that are writing fantastic works. 
and they're not with the big five. That's right. They're not with vanity presses. They're yep. not with a uh, small local press. They are doing their own work, and they want to be found. And they deserve to be found. And they do. And when yes. you've read their material, you say, oh, my gosh, this needs to be out there. That's right. And I so we're, agree. this is one of the reasons we're here, is to, we're helping to promote those people who really do have some fantastic work and need to be found. Well, being a writer was a big change in my life as a career middle school teacher. What changes have you uncovered in your life while pursuing this writing career? Earlier this year, I moderated a panel in front of 500 people. And I never in a million years would have imagined that I would do something like that. Um, seeing my books on the shelves is, is amazing to me as well. Uh, that was always a dream from when I was a little kid. Um, having fellow authors be friends of mine, it, it, this, it's just this surreal environment that I'm in now. And I just, I cannot, I, I never imagined in a million years that this would be my reality now, and um, it truly has been a dream come true. And you're doing well. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Because I know in my case, I gave up my day job. Well, I retired, actually, and had to have something to do in retirement. And <laughs> I had these people running around in my head who had to get out. And so I put them into the stories and the books here. I, I've been very fortunate that I work in a wonderful department, and I'm only part-time. Yeah. And so I can spend the rest of my time actually writing. And it, it's, it's been a great, great relationship. Well, writing fiction, authors can be enveloped by their characters. I know I have felt that. Mm -hmm. Have you felt a pull by any of your characters to lead you away from your original ideas? Uh, you mentioned Long Overdue, which uh, a library novel, I just I couldn't resist that title. Um, I had written a character to use in one scene. Basically, they were there to rescue my hero and then they were going to go away. But when I introduced her, next thing I know, she said something off, off my outline, off everything. And the next thing I know, I had to go back and redo the last third of the novel because she had just hijacked the whole thing. And I didn't expect it. And, um, but truthfully, it made the novel so much better to have that character there. And I can, I can, I haven't read the book in a while, but I can guess who that character is. Because she does have a prominent role at the end. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I will say that um, she's involved in the, uh, another book I'm working on currently. But that's all I'll say about that. Um, what? But I'm going to ask you later about your current... <laughs> well, Never mind. Well, we'll I was going to say, um, one of the things, the other reason why she made such a prominent role in my book is an early reader said, oh, if you do this, it will make it so much better. And if I get feedback that I find will make the book better, I'm going to utilize it. Uh, so I have a novel coming out in the summer of 2020 called The Galileo Disclosure. It's going to come out from Tor Forge. And the original manuscript they bought and the current version they have, I've actually lost three characters oh. because it makes it tighter mm -hmm. It tells a better story. And I actually have a major twist that originally was in the middle and now is at the very end. And it's just, it's so much better now. That's, that's what happens. And those poor characters are standing on the sideline in your head saying, what? <laughs> They'll be back. Oh, yeah. They'll be back. Yeah, when, when they start talking to me, I'll be driving, <laughs> and uh, my wife will look at me and go, is everything all right? Oh, wait a minute, someone's talking yeah, to you. Like, yeah, <laughs> they're in right. your head again. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. I know I, the current book that I have, which will be out very soon, uh, as I was going through the edit, I noticed that one of my characters, who had a minor part at the beginning, never showed up again. But it was absolutely necessary to have this person in the end of the book. So... I'm adding three more or four more chapters to the book involving this particular person. And my wife, who's one of my readers, you know, you're not supposed to have your family members do your, because they always love what you do. Oh. The, the, not in my wife's case. Oh, I was going to say, my wife, I no. love her, but she is brutally honest with oh, my writing. And yes. I, I treasure that. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I, if you tell me, oh, I liked it, that, that's not helpful to me well, at she's all. She's saying, where are the three chapters? I need them now. <laughs> so I've got I to gotta go home and finish those tonight and then 
Um, actually, I'm pretty much done with them, but uh, they need to get printed out so she can read through them. But uh, yes, for, for the folks we have watching characters this, show up. Um, my wife does not like mysteries or thrillers. So having her read them, first of all, is wonderful because she's actually going out of her comfort zone to read them to help me. And I truly appreciate that. But, yeah, she cannot stand the genre. My, my wife reads historical fiction. She doesn't like thrillers and mysteries <laughs> Either. But she reads it, yeah. She there reads you go. my books and she's, yeah. she gives me feedback. She has nice told word. me this is a really good book and well written. I believe her. You know how it is when we're marketing. We say, hey, this is a really great book. I say this because my readers have told me so. We don't know. We're always biased anyway. Well, it's true, yeah. Yeah. So who publishes your books? You did mention uh, Tor Forge. Well, Simon Schuster, as I mentioned, published my Star Trek book. Right. And. Um, the funny thing about that was the publicist didn't really know much about Star Trek, so I ended up having to turn around and do my own publicity for the most part. Got to go to San Diego Comic Con. Uh, I did a Star Trek convention on the East Coast, did a couple of Northwest events as well. That was a lot of fun. Um, and actually, the book launch was at a Barnes & Noble near my house where they had a monthly Star Trek book club. Oh, so that, was a, that was a lot of fun. I enjoyed good. that immensely. Uh, sadly, that book club doesn't exist anymore, but it was fun at the time. So I've self-published, I have done the small press, and honestly, I have to say the traditional publishing for me is the best way to go. Uh, you get the review angle, as I mentioned, you get the right. distribution. And I will also say I can tell people in my reviews why I like something. Like, you've got to read this book. It is so good. But if it's for myself, I'm the worst person to <laughs> be my own marketer. It's like, oh, you should read my book. Well, that was I'm a just quest terrible at that. That was a question I wanted to ask you was, what marketing skills have you learned, uh, which the rest of us might want to know? <laughs> or, so you don't have any? Um, well, I'll, I'll bet you do. Um, the, the trick for me, I always tell people, write the best book you can. Write the absolute best book you possibly can. And marketing is word of mouth. You get, you get a fan base, you get those people reading your books, and they like each book you write. Things happen as a result. If they pick up your book and they go, yeah. eh, or oh, that is the biggest piece of, you know, then you got a problem. Yeah. Bad word of mouth is a career killer. Good word of mouth helps spread the word, and you can keep going. And that's sort of how I look at marketing is you want to write the best book you can and have that word of mouth spreading around. And then you better write the next one because they're going to be on your case about it. Exactly. When's your next book coming out? <laughs> I read your last four. Where's yes. the next one? That's and what you want. Yeah, that's what you do want. And that's, yeah. that's what my agent says too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. When's the next one? Yeah. Well, you've been in, intimately involved in several organizations like the International Thriller Writers um, yep. Thriller Fest, which I've attended and um, the Pacific Northwest Writers Association, which you're a former board member. Right. And are there any other groups that you have that you're members of, or that you're part of? Those are the two primary ones. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things I learned when I went that first year to the Pacific Northwest Writers Association, I found myself volunteering. And I say getting yourself out there meeting the people, connecting with the fellow writers and the fellow agents and editors there as well. Volunteering was the difference for me. When you, let's say your goal is to get an agent when mm -hmm. you go to these conferences. And if you're debating whether or not to go to a conference, I 100% say you should go. I, I, here's a scenario. I have an agent I would love to get. I'm going to write a query letter and send it to that agent and it's going to sit in a pile, and then they're going to have... The slush one, pile, is the slush called. pile. There's going to be 100 that they're going to look at a week. And I've heard them say that's typical. What are your odds that they're going to want to see your material? On the other hand, if you go to a conference and you meet that person face-to-face, -face, and they say, hey, I'm interested in your work. That sounds really interesting. You go back, you write the query letter, and you say we talked at this conference and you asked to see my materials and here it is. That face-to-face -face just moved you to the top of the pile. I always say though, if your writing is good and the agent likes it, 
that's all you need. That's really all you need. It's really all you need. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. So the importance of going to or writing associations like PNWA or International Thriller Writers is this interaction with other people who are going through the same thing you're going through mm -hmm. and to learn from them. One of the things that I have found out, and I'm sure you have too, is we meet at these conferences some of the most prolific and famous and highly thought of authors in this world of ours. Yes. And they're just people. Mm -hmm. They're just like we are. Yeah. Um, they've, gone those, they've gone those fewer steps to famousness. Is that a word? The first like, year I was at Thriller Fest, I volunteered, yeah. and I was asked to help Clive Cussler. And Clive Cussler was one of my, you know, yeah. I, I love the man. I love his books. And so I'm helping him, and my Star Trek book had just come out at that time. And this person comes running down the aisle, and I'm supposed to get Clive to an event before he's supposed to sign books. And I say, you know, no, no, I'm sorry. Mr. You know, Mr. Cussler has to go over here. You know, so I'm sorry, you could go talk to him there. And the person said, no, no, I want to talk, to, talk you. to you. You wrote the Star Trek novel. <laughs> and I looked at them and I said, this is Clive Cussler, are you nuts? <laughs> and Clive laughed, the person laughed, and I realized, wait a minute. <laughs> you just became famous. Yeah, for... That for a one moment. brief second, for a moment. and Clive Cussler said it was the greatest thing. Yeah. Um, being at those conferences, volunteering, you, you have <laughs> sessions, you have interactions that you wouldn't necessarily have with other conferences, just attending. And I have to say, a good example is Thriller Fest. Which, um, I started off volunteering, next thing I know I'm on a panel, next thing I know I'm moderating panels, and one of the panels I moderated ended up being, and I didn't know this at the time, it ended up being an audition for me to become a freelancer for the AP. Very good. Very you just good. never know. You just uh, Right, and you yeah. don't. You don't. Yeah. I, and I had fun. I was on with um, a panel at Thriller Fest a few years ago. Mm -hmm. and that was a great, it was a lot of fun. It really was, just being up there answering questions of the people that are writing books just like I am. Yeah. Um, and obviously some conferences are better than others, but... Yeah. Um, I always say, do your research, be prepared. Or if a book club or other organization wants to invite you to speak with them, how do we get a hold of you? Uh, I'm here. No. Uh, <laughs> well, it will be above your head. Oh, okay. Well, no, the truth is that uh, I'm one of those guys who does not do social media well, and my agent is telling me that's got to change before my Galileo book comes out. So you can find me on Facebook, and uh, please feel free to say hello. And... For next year, um, I'm going to be doing Thriller Fest again, and I do a podcast with John Robb of Suspense Magazine called Beyond the Cover, and that's part of the Suspense Radio Network, and I recommend folks who like hearing about the business side of writing, and uh, we've had some great guests on there like Harlan Coben, Michael Conley, we've had Kevin O'Brien, and a couple other folks you've had over here yeah. too. Um, it's a lot of fun to do. and. We're actually going to be at uh, Thriller Fest this year, or next year, going to be doing on-camera interviews. And uh, John knows, and you know how much I love doing camera interviews. So. <laughs> Should be a lot of fun. We'll, we'll enjoy that. Yes. I was going to wear a Mickey Mouse t-shirt, but I was told I couldn't do that. So you've already told us about what you're currently working on. How soon is this coming out? Galileo Disclosure is supposed to be the summer of 2020. At least that's the projected time now. Those things always change. You never know. Um, so, some other stuff I'm working on, um, one of the things I do, and th this is sort of, because I wrote a companion book to all the novels, I now do in-house Bibles for authors and their estates. Mm. And I'll give you an example of that. Um, let's say you are hired to continue writing a series that, say, James Patterson is doing. and rather than you having to go back and read all the previous books in that series to understand who the characters are and what's happened what hasn't happened you're handed a series bible saying here's all the relevant stuff you need to know to start writing them i'm the one that writes those very good so that, that's been a lot of fun to very do good. Um, i'm also writing a, a cozy mystery with another author i met at thriller fest and uh, that's been a lot of fun and uh yeah, um, we're actually going to be finishing that at the end of the month. 
Very good. Uh, and I'm working on a national park thriller, and that's been fun researching. And uh, there's actually two other projects I'm working on I can't discuss. Very good. Yeah. Very good. Well, Jeff, I want to thank you for coming and sharing all that you do in this world of ours. And I look me. forward to following your career. And, uh, well, I can't wait endeavors. for your next book either, so hurry up. All right. And we share a common interest in this writing, and of course we would like to have you be part of our Kitsap Literary Artists and Writers group. And if you would like to at some time come back here and interview someone that you want to bring in, we'd be glad to have you do it. Oh, that'd be fun. You can sit over here, your person <laughs> can sit over there, we'll have some fun. That sounds great. I and I would like to thank all of our viewers for tuning in to the Bremerton Kitsap Access Television and viewing this Kitsap Literary Artists and Writers production. I also wish to thank the BCAT staff on cameras and in the director's chair. Our broadcasts are scheduled for Saturday evenings at 6, 6 p.m. on Wave Cable Channel 3 and Comcast Channel 12. And you can also view a live stream on the BCAT website at bkat.org. Be sure you're at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Keep in touch with our social media and author web pages to discover where you can meet local authors and artists. And I hope everyone has a pleasant evening and a productive and fascinating week. And until next Saturday, I am Peter Stockwell with Kitsap Literary Artists and Writers in conjunction with the Bremerton Kitsap Access Television. Good night.